Welcome to Unmute. Uh, this is Jack.org's Mental Health Men's Roundtable. Jack.org, a little bit about the organization itself. Uh, Jack.org is Canada's only national charity training and empowering young leaders to revolutionize mental health in every province and territory. So I'm going to give a bit of a kind of overviewing paragraph just to start off this call and give a bit of the motivation. And then I'll do a quick overview as well as some introductions for you guys. So Globally, it is estimated that a man dies by suicide every minute. In Canada alone, over 3,000 men died by suicide in 2017. This is more than three times the number for that of women. Men who are part of certain populations can face especially stark mental health outcomes. Racism towards Indigenous peoples and the dominance of colonialist systems in Canada have created conditions where the average suicide rate for Indigenous men is double that of the national average, with the suicide rate for Inuit men 11 times that of the national average. Gay men also report higher rates of depression, anxiety, suicidality, self-harm, and substance abuse in comparison to their heterosexual counterparts. What's especially troubling is that males are the least likely gender to speak up about what's going on and seek treatment for their mental health. If we wanna change that, we need to understand what prevents them from talking. Today, we're going to discuss some of these things, uh, and I'm joined with great leaders here. So I'm going to go ahead and start off by just kind of, everyone, if you could do a two-minute introduction about who you are and uh, what you're kind of bringing to this call. I'm going to go in zoomological order, so that means, Asante, you are first in my gallery view here. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, nice to meet you all. Uh, my name is Asante Houghton. Uh, I'm a pretty big mental health advocate. Uh, I've, I, I do a lot of things. I do a lot of public speaking. Uh, that's probably like my main uh, form of advocacy. Uh, a lot of telling my story, uh, a lot of commentary on the intersections of race and mental health, um, you know, intersplicing in, you know, social determinants of mental health, etc. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sarar. Uh, a bit about me. I, I go to McMaster. I'm in my third year. I'm a co-lead at Jack Dorn McMaster. And that's really where I spend a lot of my time, you know, working to build a community of understanding at my fac in my faculty and really uh, working with my team to create events that stimulate mental health advocacy and understanding. And that's, I'm also a Jack speaker, which I've done a couple last year and that was incredible. Uh, and aside from Jack Dorg, I work as a youth soccer coach. So soccer, huge, passionate in my life. And I love getting to spend time with these kids and teach them about this amazing sport that's, you know, that I've loved growing up. And I also write and create poetry and music. So. Uh, I'm Jesse Lipscomb. I'm an actor, uh, an activist and an artist. I'm a singer and a writer. I spend a lot of my time, you know, speaking, a lot of motivational speaking, a lot of diversity, inclusivity, uh, training and speaking. But, you know, like as a, as a person more than anything, I really live, I really like live a life as authentically and vulnerably as possible, specifically because most of my life is on display uh, and realizing like representation across the board, whether we're talking about black men, uh, whether we're talking about men who are comfortable with the full gamut of emotions, uh, doing things however they feel they want to do them. I will dance publicly. I will wear whatever I want to wear, whatever colors. I will cry in front of everybody and really just trying to show uh, that life for my three sons, as well as people who watch and look up to create as safe a space as I can everywhere I go. So it's kind of just a, uh, I'm a professional passion follower and, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good life. Hi right, guys, my name is Quinn Wood. Um, I'm an Indigenous youth from Scarborough, Ontario. I am a youth advocate. Like I, I've volunteered in uh, youth advisory councils for Indigenous youth across the city. I'm an artist, a father, and uh, someone who's very big on uh, mental health. So, yeah, thank you guys for having me. Hey fellas, uh, my name is Jake. I'm the executive director and co-founder of an organization called Next Gen Men. Uh, we're working towards a future where boys and men experience less pain and cause less harm. On kind of behind that background, uh, you can never really tell on Zoom, but uh, I'm six foot eight. I used to be a semi-pro basketball player. And, you know, when I was kind of on the peak of the world, I was really struggling with my mental health in the form of depression and a lot of internal dialogue around, you can't ask for help, you can't show emotion, you gotta be tough. 
and it wasn't even anything that anyone else was putting on me. It was, it was all internal. So uh, that's just how deep that culture goes. So um, that's, that's kind of the passion and the entry point into this work for me. And I'm looking forward to this conversation with y'all. Uh, hi everyone. So I'm Patrice. I'm a network rep for Jack.org. I represent New Brunswick. I'm also a talk speaker and I go to St. Thomas University in Fracton, New Brunswick, where I'm a, I'm a track athlete. So I have kind of like an expertise mental health related to sports. Hi everyone, my name is Jayla Gatsby and I am the network rep for British Columbia, Canada. And I have been passionate for music for all of my life. Um, but aside from that, I've been a mental health advocate since probably I was like 15, um, because a lot of my friends were struggling and I saw that there was a gap in the system and I really needed to change that. Um, as well, I'm an advocate for LGBTQ plus youth and also for youth that um, have struggled with their body positivity and also for Asian cultures, because again, I think it's a huge thing for Asians, especially immigrant Asians um, that come to Canada. You know, we go through the struggle where we have to always make our parents proud and like always try to be the best and try to get the best education. And I'm also a psych major as well. So I'm kind of making my parents proud, but um, <laughs> again, I'm working for this beautiful company called Jack.org and I can't wait to keep going, um, but so far so good. And thank you guys for listening. Uh, my name is Sukhmeet Singh Satchel. I am a second year medical student at the University of British Columbia. A few of the projects that I've been involved with are I'm the uh, ambassador for the Canadian Medical Association for their um, health and wellness team. And so that's where I really got involved a lot with Jack.org. So my name is Alfred Bergeson. Um, I'm out in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and I'm a member of the Prime Minister's Youth Council, as well as uh, I work full time with the Centre for Employment Innovation out here in Nova Scotia. I'm someone who just recently sort of uh, got in touch with nature, and so um, I've been enjoying that journey. Great, so thank you guys all for your introductions. I will just give a quick one. So my name is Riley Wells. I am today's host. I'm a recent graduate from Queen's University uh, in engineering. I worked with Jack Dodorg last year as a Jack speaker. Got a couple of uh, speak, uh, speakings out uh, before COVID hit, and uh, naturally that shook things up a bit. Uh, but with that, uh, through school, I was a big mental health advocate. I was involved with an organization called Queens for the Boys, which actually intersects great with this entire topic. So some of the things we're looking to get uh, out of today's chat is a discussion of different mental health journeys, uh, some facts about men's mental health, maybe what the future of men's mental health should look like. And we're looking to also just kind of model the idea of a healthy conversation between men and kind of model that for people. So the first thing we have up on our agenda here is obstacles to seeking help. Uh, so with men, one of the toughest things to do is to actually bring forward uh, the notion of needing help. So within this, uh, we have a couple barriers just set in place already. So we have things like cultural barriers, we have lack of safe spaces, toxic masculinity, pop culture representation. Great. Well, thanks for having me, Riley. From the list of um, items that you said, I think the ones that resonated the most with me were the cultural barriers and toxic masculinity. I think those are two of the biggest issues that I've seen, especially in the South Asian community, in, tr uh, in men trying to access um, uh, mental health services. So I'll start off with a little bit about my journey, if that's okay. Uh, sure. So I immigrated from India to Canada in 2002. I was around seven years old. And when I moved here, I was bullied and I was teased for the way that I looked, for a turban that I wore, um, an Indian accent that I had at that time, and the clothes that I had. And so this happened for a year and a half where I was getting bullied all the time. I didn't really know why this was happening to me. And especially it was weird to me because it was actually other South Asian kids who looked exactly like me who were bullying me. And it made no sense to me at all. I'm like, I thought Canada is a place that accepts every single person. I thought I would fit in so well here, um, but that was not the reality that I was seeing. And really, I think my parents started noticing a difference in me. They started noticing that I was getting a little bit more sad, um, perhaps even going to depression. These were just some of the things that they noticed in me. And I really had to look within myself during that time. At that time, my parents didn't even know like who to talk to about it because again, as new immigrants, it's very difficult just for all of us to adjust. And I didn't want to put any more barriers or any more problems on my parents' shoulders who are already, you know, trying to find new jobs here, trying to 
learn the lifestyle here. And so for me, it was like, okay, I was trying to keep everything in and not really sharing it with anyone. And I think it just got worse and worse until one day I told my principal who I still keep in touch with till today. I told my principal, I'm like, this is what's happening to me in your school. I am getting bullied right now. And he said something really great to me. He's like, find mentors and find people that you can trust and you can talk to openly. And that was the first time in my life really when I had the ability to talk to someone after a few years, eventually the bullying stopped. But then after that stopped and I moved to a different school, I noticed a similar problem. And the problem was that a lot of my indigenous friends in my class were getting bullied. And this was in grade seven. And having been bullied before and having felt the way that I did, I knew how they were going through this. And I knew that no one should be ever treated like this. And so in grade seven, um, I decided to take action upon that. And I created something that I didn't even know I did actually until I graduated from high school and I went back to my elementary school and I was just thanking my teachers. And they said, you know, in grade seven, you started um, the first ever powwow dance at our school. And this led to a friendship club at our school. And that just shows you the power that someone has without even knowing that they're taking action. Why I'm bringing this up is because a lot of the times uh, youth feel that they're alone. Uh, they don't have someone to talk to. But I think when you find that one person who you can trust and who you can talk to about your feelings, especially as an immigrant kid who didn't know anyone here. And so I believe like we need to really focus now more on how can we work with people who are either immigrants or people from minority groups people who are from different backgrounds and cultural backgrounds to help break this toxic masculinity that we're facing and i think once we're able to achieve that uh, we'll really be able to improve the rate of mental health um, in men across canada well wow, thank you so much for that story that was uh that's amazing. And I really like how you're able to kind of tie back and really give back to the community and uh, the people who helped you out and really, really see that, identify that and help out other people that you saw might be in need as well. So thanks for sharing that. Um, I think I, I have quite a similar story in that I moved to Canada when I was seven from Ghana and obviously being black and moving to a, a very rural community. There, were, there weren't a lot of people that looked like me and had the similar life experience that I did. So um, it definitely, you know, faced challenges with that. Um, and growing up, you know, at a young age, my, my parents got a divorce. And so I didn't have a dad around. Um, and so, you know, growing up, it was sort of, it, it felt alone. It felt quite lonely, honestly. Um, and, but we did what we could. And it was, it was when I got involved with team sports, basketball is when I started to actually like you know, be around other, other guys uh, regularly and be able to relate to them um, through sport. I think having a, a coach, having, you know, a basketball coach throughout my, my childhood and, and my teenage years was a really important um, thing for me to have. Um, to have a coach mentor me um, was, has always been a major part of my development, I think. And so, you know, I think, it, and for, for myself, I think I've I definitely had moments where my mental health has been like low or um, not not well, and I think recently I've been paying more attention to that. I think in the last couple of years I've been spending more time in nature and more time being still, and I think that's allowed me to sort of better understand like how my childhood was or um, how I am now the time that I've spent in nature recently has really helped me sort of uh, tune into uh, my mental health. And, um, but I would agree with what Sook said in terms of society and culture has probably been the biggest barrier for me um, when I was growing up to sort of take care of my mental health was not feeling like I could relate to others in the community or, you know, not really having other black male figures to, to, to confine in. I think lately, now that I'm sort of in my early 20s, um, I've just had a lot of time to reflect on that. And I think that's been helpful for me to, to better understand where I'm at and sort of what I need to be well. Yeah, like the Asian culture, we never really talk about our feelings just because um, 
you know, we're supposed to be the man in the house. Like, that's what they, they always tell me and the kids and the cousins. You know, you guys have to be, like, the guys have to lead the household. And, like, for me to hear that, it is hard because I, I say no, because my mom can lead the house if she really wanted to. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be a man. It doesn't have to be a male identifying man. It can be anyone. And so, you know, I've learned through experiences from other men or experiences from myself that I should be able to see that anyone can lead and that a man can be so much more <laughs> honestly Asian culture it is quite hard for us to be able to express our feelings and through that I've learned to you know find times to sit down with like my, my uncles and my grandparents and my dad to be able to talk about these problems because that's what initiated me and for them to initiate them talking about their feelings because I was able to open up about myself you know my background is, is Jamaican I mean I was born in Jamaica but I came to Toronto uh, when I was like super young like two years old um, but anyway, it's still just, you know, I have two older brothers who are a lot older than me, um, you know, so like they had to some extent the experience of like growing up in Jamaica and like internalizing those values. So I always had these things uh, around me. And, you know, the biggest thing was like as, as a man or as a dude, like you just had to be hard all the time. You know, then you combine that with my environment where, you know, I was growing up in the project. So that was just like reinforced even more. Uh, as you know every, everyone around me seemed to like the whole name of the game is like the hardest dude in the neighborhood got the most respect kind of thing and had the most power you know socially or what have you uh, so of course you know that kind of gets internalized or you know you get conditioned to think that way so when you start experiencing things you know that are like emotional or like you know you there, there are sensitivities or insecurities or whatever you start to look at yourself like yo am i a punk like what's wrong with me uh of course you know invariably when you experience mental health challenges you know that's it's not really a good mix to to have all that happening so uh for me it was it was a huge impact because it just i felt so small that i didn't want anybody else to see that and you know it was it was a lot of messaging from like my culture that was telling me that to even feel anything that wasn't like a machismo macho emotion like you know anger generally or you know or like chasing women so that meant that you like weren't a real man you know what i'm saying so and i and i got you know some of those messages reinforced at home and you know in the music we we're listening to and just all of those pieces so it made it really hard for me not not only just to like talk to others but to even accept myself as someone who has you know an emotional world at all so a bunch of us in this call are involved with music either from making it listening to it or enjoying it um so i was wondering if i could open up the floor to anyone who wants to speak on kind of how music as well as tv and traditional media on instagram things like that might contribute to the men's mental health epidemic as a content creator myself, uh, you know, I feel like there's I would, maybe about 15 years ago, I made a conscious shift that I have to also be responsible for what I'm making and what I'm putting out there. And, you know, like as an actor or as a singer, it's like you get a gig, I just want it, I'll take it. And then whatever it is, not realizing that every little pebble that I'm dropping into this toxic masculinity pond is actually creating waves. And it's, it's up to me as much as it's up to anyone else to create like different pathways for people to recognize and understand. And I'm saying this stuff, which might be even a segue to something else you were talking about, because I've, my journey has often been kind of by myself. I, I was able to express uh, my emotions. I was able to seemingly get through all of the things. Uh, and as I say that, often that person people would lean on and then become this rock and then have no idea where I go. Where do I go for, for help? And there's always this assumption that I'm okay. Jesse, you're good, of course. I mean, it doesn't matter what it is, you'll be all right, right? And, and not even on purpose, but that became, that became my persona. I'm all right, right? I'm always all right. And then when you find that spot of, of breaking where, uh, you know, because I'm, you know, whether I'm trying to create the right content, I'm trying to create the right music, trying to create these safe spaces. But then I have had a big struggle with, A, asking for help, where to find it myself, um, and circles like these, which I think if I, I, and I'm not an expert, but I find the most valuable, just men talking to men and understanding where our breaks are and they're all in different cracks and different places. And that, you know, some of the unlikeliest sources can be the biggest pieces of help, but I still, to this day, uh, struggle with like, 
who do I call right now for that circle? So I know that wasn't the question, but it was kind of the segue because uh, that's kind of what it felt like for me. Like I get the responsibility of content creation and creating these things, but also those, those people who are doing it, us as mental health advocates, where do we go sometimes, you know? It's been interesting seeing pop culture for sure because I've never seen someone with a turban in the mainstream media in Hollywood, you know? Never seen mm -hmm. it happen. And just recently, actually, I think last week was the first time ever uh, Demi Lovato released a music video. And in that, there were people from all different backgrounds. And there was a sick man in there. And I was just in shock because just like, you know how you were talking about the website that you went to? For me, that was like my shock. I'm like, wow, this is the first time that I'm seeing someone who looks like me in a music video. And that was so nice for me to see. Um, again, I think that breaks down the barriers for other young sick boys out there who are seeing the TV and they don't see someone that looks like them, especially like you mentioned, pop culture. That's something that is ingrained into our society. It's ingrained into our generation where we are spending more and more time on YouTube, on Spotify, et cetera, et cetera. And just recently I was talking to my friend and my friend and I, we go to the gym a lot together. And the other day he was telling me, he's like, oh, I had a milkshake today and I had this today and I feel like I got fat. I'm like, what? <laughs> like, how? Um, so I think these are just some things that a lot of men now are very cognizant about. They don't like to share it a lot of the times. I think just me and my friend, because we're very tight. He was telling me all these things and I'm just like, well, I don't um, like, you're great the way you are. Uh, your body is great. And I think a lot of the times, maybe men need to hear that because they haven't been told that. And so yeah. when I told my friend this, he was like, okay, well, maybe I should stop obsessing myself over these little things. Like I'm allowed to eat what I want and still be healthy at the same time. And so I think that is something that's missing in our society. And I know in, um, for women, it's talked about a lot where body positivity, and we've started seeing more modeling agencies cast people who might be, a, you know, not the traditional size zero that are bigger women. And I think it's amazing. I think it's now also time for men to get that position where in society, when people, when young kids look up to their TV, they're going to be like, okay, that is someone I can relate to. That is someone that I see myself within. And I don't need to be dieting all the time in order to look like that. I don't need to be going to the gym all the time to look like that. I can be myself and be the healthiest version of myself. Yeah, so just to touch on when I lost all my weight, like it started off like as a healthy journey, but slowly transitioned to something not as healthy. Because if you like look up online, there's all these diets, there's all these, all these things that you can easily find. You go on Instagram, I get ads on the daily that are like, fasting try this try this and then it just promotes this culture and then eventually i started obsessing slowly on like what i was eating so i would cut out sugars fat and just like really focus on like clean cleans eating really it has to be like pretty much i garden in myself i eat it like i wouldn't i wouldn't touch fast food i wouldn't eat chocolate because in my head chocolate was like you eat like this, like one tiny chocolate bar, you're going to gain weight. I mean, even as like uh, an athlete who, you know, had three practices a week, going to the weight room three times a week, one to two games a week, like, you know, peak of my physical career at the time, I did not appreciate my body. And now I'm in my, you know, early thirties. And I look back at those pictures and I'm like, damn, I want that again. <laughs> so I, I feel that Patrice for sure. But on the, on the kind of note around, you know, who do we to, turn to and, and ask for help and building a bit on what Jesse was saying, you know, us men for a long time, for most of our lives, I think lean a lot on women to do a lot of our emotional labor, you know, whether that be family members like, like mothers and sisters and stuff like that, or eventually partners and, and women we're dating. It puts a lot of pressure and strain on those relationships as well, too, especially romantic relationships, because, you know, I, I know I did this and, and I hear this a lot as well, too. But, you know, when you're when you're pouring yourself out to this person, you're like, I've never told anyone any of this before. Like, it's such a privileged position for them to hold that space. But then, like, the risk of, you know, whether you break up or something like that is so steep and it, and it puts so much pressure on that that relationship. 
So part of my healing journey through therapy and stuff like that, I was blessed with some like really good guy friends and I would like, you know, go to them and be like, here, here's some of my shit, hold it for me. And like, you know, park some of that with three guys or something like that. And then if something in my life was happening, I could go to them and be like, Hey, you know, that shit that I told you about, like, you know, something's going on with it and they would understand. And then obviously hold that reciprocal space as well too, which then takes a lot of pressure off a relationship, uh, like romantic relationships and whatnot. And I think that's really important, but like, it's really important for us men to be able to, to speak with each other about this as well too. But I think it's also still important to um, continue those, those relationships and conversations uh, full of emotion with, with people of all genders, because, you know, when we, when we as guys kind of come to our understanding, sometimes we might leave other people and their lived experiences out of it too. So it's just the more people we can kind of have these conversations with, the, the more empathy we build around it. So I saw this uh, beer commercial recently on TV and it was targeting toxic masculinity. And I thought this is incredible. Um, I can't remember the beer, but I do remember the premise of the commercial was um, this guy's um, drinking beer with his friend at a bar. And he turns to me and he's like, can I tell you something? He's like, yeah, I really don't like beer. And then the whole commercial went on. Uh, it's like, what? But I thought you liked it. Even, you know, that, um, you know, Big Fred in the back, he loves beer. And then the Big Fred's like, actually, I don't even like beer. I like it because it's the thing to do. And, you know, this commercial went on, really talked about it, went into that. And I thought, this is incredible. Like, this is genuinely impactful that there's going to be guys out there who are going to take this and be like, hey, you know what, it's okay if I don't like beer or, you know, blank space, whatever else it is. I can talk to my guy, my, you know, my buddy sitting at the bar next to me or Big Fred in the back and just, you know, it's all right. I thought that was really impactful and a good step forward. That definitely resonates with me because I don't know where it was taught to me, but it was definitely taught to me growing up where, like, you know, emotions are only safe with women and not safe with men. And that led to a lot of, uh, you know, situations where, I was, you know, dumping on uh, on the, all of my stuff uh, on onto people, and created a lot of, you know, challenging situations. One, I mean, it's probably not fair for me to be going going around like, you know, dumping my stuff on women. You know, they didn't sign up for that. You know, I need to, you know, figure out a way to, you know, develop all of my resources so I don't need to be doing that. But the other piece is like, not for nothing, but when when you do that, like emotional exchange, sometimes that creates like this feeling of connection for people. And then I would find myself in these situations where I I ended up like hurting these women because my, I guess my emotional processing with them was being taken as more than just platonic friendship. It was was just a lot of drama for for real, for real. Uh, But the other piece is then like, as I recognized that and I was trying to work on it, um, I realized that I could go to my guy friends. I've always been afraid to, but when I did, I didn't face any resistance. And in, in fact, in a lot of ways, they, they were able to, to help so deeply because they also understood the context of what it was to, to be a man and, you know, growing up, you know, receiving these kinds of messages and also feeling isolated with their emotions. And what I realized is that when I started talking to my guy friends about stuff, they all started talking about stuff. And it actually was like an invitation for all of us to start dealing with, with with things and for me it really came out of like a traumatic situation that like I didn't know what to do so I just started talking about it and then all of a sudden we all just started talking about these like traumas and experiences that we had n- never really raised with anybody so it's important that I think for us to be able to you know take that risk and be a little brave and and you know try test the waters with, with, with our guy friends. I want to touch on a little bit about that like kind of like just kind of like keeping everything bottled up. So I grew up in Scarborough. I grew up in like a really high risk, um, low income neighborhood. When I was young, I saw something really traumatic though when I was like 13. In my, in my neighborhood, I grew up in an indigenous housing complex and there's a lot of drinking and, and drugs involved even at a young age. I'd say at about 11, we, we all started smoking weed. By 12, like we could pay somebody's dad to go to the LCBO for us and get us liquor. You know what I mean? So when I was about 13, um, we used to all be able to stay at this kid's house. Like it was a flop house. And um, I ended up, his dad was a massive drunk. His uncle was a massive drunk. 
they molested his three-year-old niece. And I and I, I was witness to it, right? For a while, I, um, where I'm from especially, they say, oh, you don't talk to police. Da, 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 you don't talk to police. So in my head, that stuck, right? Even though I didn't know I was so young, I, didn't, I wasn't able to differentiate the fact that, okay, you can go to the police about something like this, right? This, this is something to do with a little girl's life. So I, I was forced to bottle this in. Well, I wasn't forced, but my, my, my mindset forced me to bottle this in for a while until I realized, you know, like I could, I could go to somebody about this. So it took about like six months of me bottling this in, right? What was hard too was going to friends about it. You know what I mean? You're, you're, you're supposed to like be able to, to like handle things on your own, right? Where I'm from, if you see something like that, you're supposed to deal with it on your own. Like, like who knows, like go hurt those people by yourself, right? So that was something I really had to hold in for a long while. But once I was able to finally get it off my chest, right? It, 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 it helped a lot. I'm starting to realize that like men are becoming more and more aware of, of mental health because a lot of us are experiencing it, right? And uh, we're, we're becoming a lot more sensitive to the fact of it, right? I can go to some of my guy friends and be like, hey, like I'm, I'm having panic attacks or you know what I mean? And you know, round tables like this and stuff are really important, I think, for us men to, you know, be able to realize like, holy crap, a lot of us go through this shit. And like, it, it's, it's great to talk about with others. Yeah, so I just want to touch on what you said, Quinn, that like people that mostly men that speak about it are seen as weak or just you bottle it, it in. So like it reminded me like back in high school or even middle school, we'd get we would get these presentation about like depression or like mental health. And I remember just sitting in the audience with all my guy friends, and then we had this one guy being like, Oh, this is dumb. Why are we even here? And then it's kind of and like it's kind of like this bro effect where everyone's like, oh yeah, you're right, and we all said it. Is there any of us that really understood why we're saying it's dumb or why we're like, it's weak for us to talk about it? No, there's just one person that kind of sets out the criteria that said, you talk about it, you're weak. This is dumb. We shouldn't be here. And then from there, we're just there, like growing up, thinking like, this one person that told us that that's the absolute truth. Yeah, and chances are that that one person is actually dealing with it more than everyone else, right? And it's it's that mask that they're putting on to push it away, right? Mm -hmm. But on the flip side of that, if we know that that one person has the power to like, you know, kind of have the bro effect and, and quiet all of us down, but, you know, listening to Asante and like when he talks uh, with his guy friends, all of them start talking. And when Quinn's like, you I'll tell anybody about my story and the professional work that you guys do with Jack.org, like that one person, like I, I talk, you know, across Canada and workplaces and schools and communities, all that stuff. Like, I don't even see anything that I'm doing as special. Like, I just am there to give other people permission, right? Like if this, like, you know, giant of a man can like sit there and be like, yo, I deal with depression. I deal with anxiety. You know, I went to therapy. I, I do the, all these kind of things. Like that's not, oh, he's so wonderful. That's me just being like, if I can do it, you can do it too. And we know the power of that one person. Yeah, that's amazing, Jake. I, I really resonate with that as well. A lot of time people are like, you're so brave for sharing or something like that. And it's like, I'm not, I'm not brave for telling people I went to therapy. You know, people are going through significantly worse. I'm just telling people so that more people can feel open about going in the first place. That's all we want. And what, what you're kind of touching on here is the idea of like a safe space. And it, it's incredible to think how little it takes sometimes to actually open up a safe space. It can be as blatant as setting up a 10 person uh, multi-provincial Zoom call or it can be as simple as at the end of your night when everyone's had a couple drinks and you're getting food at McDonald's, someone just says something, you know, it slips out and all of a sudden you, you're talking about it, right? So it can be a really simple way and it, it's actually kind of saddening how easy it is to open up these safe spaces uh, and how worried a lot of men are coming forward with 
these struggles that they could have been dealing with for a very, very long time. Uh, and this kind of brings back the overarching uh, concept of toxic masculinity. And that's a lot of what we're po poking at today. For example, have you guys ever seen scrolling through Instagram and it says something to do with self-care? Immediately the font for that list that is gonna come up will be in pink cursive, right? And that is not something that necessarily resonates with all men, right? It, it is being brought forward through a more feminine lens, as well as some of the, even the items on that list might be go for a bubble bath or go knit a new sweater, right? Although these are certainly things that men could do, they might not necessarily resonate as well with men. And this idea of toxic masculinity can kind of spread into actual things that are meant for men, such as therapies, such as meditation, such as other ways to help yourself. Uh, then they're brought in with this kind of female connotation and that turns a lot of men away from it because their whole life they were taught to uh, get over it, you'll be fine, who cares, things like that. And now all of a sudden they're doing this kind of female self-care thing and they're scared to do it. Yeah, luckily I think recently you know, I've, I've seen people like, um, I think Travis Dorsey with Twitter. Um, I think he's the founder, Travis Dorsey is one of the co-founders of Twitter. He's been someone who's been talking a lot more about mindfulness and meditation and, and the importance of that and the, the importance of like getting away and doing nothing for a little while and then coming back to focus. Um, and I think we need more, we need more ambassadors like that, especially like people in the tech space, people who are developing these apps, tools, social media platforms that we're all consuming. I think we need to hear them talk about their mental health and how, you know, how they stay sane and what, what are some of the things they do. So I, I, I think I, I really welcome that. And I was really impressed to uh, recently hear some, some of Travis Dorsey's comments about that. Yeah, that's amazing. Like the, uh, the influx of these apps, like Headspace, for example, is a really uh, big yeah. one. It's probably the biggest one that most of us here have heard about. And uh, apps like that are amazing. But now kind of a question. So these apps exist, right? And I don't know who their customer base is. But the question right now is that if you see that marketed on your Instagram uh, and your mail, do you think that you would be likely to click on it? Or for example, some of my friends kind of express the ideology that uh, the idea of mindfulness and meditation is girly and it's not something we do. And, you know, if I want to, you know, take it easy or something, I'll go out and not do that, basically. What do you, what do you think about that mantra? What do you think about that mindset? How would you combat it? Uh, how, do you, how do you think men would feel about using an app like that? Self-care is, like, so important. Like, we, we kind of, like, tend to, like, run from those little things, right? Like, like you said, like, a bubble bath or something. But, like, who cares if you're a man? If, if, if taking a bath every day and just relaxing for an hour and just being alone with your thoughts and being able to clear your mind, if that helps you, then who can tell you no, right? It's just the toxic masculinity is what makes us tend to run from those things, right? Or, like, like the meditation or something, you know? we're scared that if somebody might walk by and we're, we're sitting by the water and just meditating, they're like, Oh, look at that. Look at that weird guy. It doesn't matter. Who cares? We're doing this for ourselves to better ourselves. Self-care is extremely important. Being turned away by like feminine things. I think that's looking back in my life. Those are there's been such like pivotal moments. that I just remember um, even the other day I came across a screenshot of a text conversation I was having like grade nine, you know, I was thir 13, 14 years old. And I think it was the first time, the reason I screenshot it, I think at the time was because the first time someone had asked me in a very long time, I'd answered honestly, what is my greatest fear? And my greatest fear in that moment was not being respected because I really was emotional and cheesy and I like sappy things. And I remember thinking like, yeah, like, you know, I would put on this bravado and this facade, like, no, like no one can see that side of me because if they see that side of me, it's feminine, it's weak. And that really stuck with me, you know, something I'd still think about today. And even going further back, I remember this one time, I was probably like third, second, third grade. And I remember being at the school uh, library and checking out these books, like it was Mary Kate and Ashley books. They're these books, these two girl detectives. I remember going to check out um, and it was a couple books and the two older kids, like they gave me this look. And even being like in second, third grade, I could tell like they, they think it's weird that I'm getting these books. I remember that also stuck with me, like, this is a thing girls read. And I just, you know, growing up thinking, wow, like, even the books that we read, but how we choose to take knowledge in or, you know, enjoy ourselves, that's even tainted. 
by toxic masculinity. And that's something, you know, I carry with me to this day and I still use it to reflect on myself and grow. I know that's something that definitely touches all of us. Yeah, certainly. Thanks for sharing that. You know, uh, a thing that's coming up for me as we're having this conversation is like this inherent sexism and all of that, which is a, a part of the whole toxic masculinity piece. You know, as we continue to have these conversations, one of the you know points of evolution is is that we we start to look at emotions one not as weakness, but also for everybody. You know, and, and I think also it's important to recognize that it's not only like heterosexual males that are dealing with this, right? I, I think a lot of our conversation right thus far has been kind of like heteronormative in that way. And it's, it's important to really open up that conversation about, you know, uh, you know, the varieties of different ways in which masculinity can be expressed um, or, you know, in which you know, folks with masculine bodies uh, can, you know, you know, be in the world. Uh, so th this conversation is, is, is so deep and there's so many layers to it. It's just really important for me that I think we keep it going and, and trying to always just, you know, unravel what, what, what's underneath and um, create healthier narratives that are, are not also diminishing the narratives of, of others uh, as we deal with this conversation or diminishing the identities of others, I should say, as we're having this conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for that point, Asante. And uh, mm -hmm. from a prior point where we were speaking about uh, disclosing things to uh, girlfriends and things like that, uh, that was definitely a point of heteronormality. And that can certainly apply to any significant other, uh, no matter where on the spectrum. But the idea of having a significant other in your life who is no matter what on your team naturally opens up a place where you can say, hey, I can dump all of this emotional baggage on this person not necessarily a girlfriend. So thank you for that. And on to Jay. Yeah, you guys talked on a lot of topics that I really want to talk about. Um, Asante, thank you for introducing um, heteronormativity and basically having men not be heterosexual. So I identify as gay and it is hard because in my entire life, I grown up with people telling me that what I am is wrong. Every day, literally every day. I go into my grandparents' house, they ask me, who's your girlfriend? Do you have a new girlfriend now? Um, and I always have to tell them, no, like I focused on school. And that's what I always said. Like it was like go to narrative. I'm always focusing on school and it always worked. Um, and like, I always tried, I remember when I was a kid, I tried playing with dolls. My parents, they frowned. They were like, you're not supposed to play with that. And I was like, okay, no worries. I'll play with like, I don't know, trucks. And, um, you know, let's put up a narrative for like how I grew up because I grew up very Catholic. And growing up Catholic, we weren't allowed to be with a guy. I'm starting getting emotional. I've had a really hard day already, but yeah, like it's just hard because every day I have to come out. Like it's just, I deal with this pain where I go into these conversations with guys and it's, hard because not many people are like me you know like femininity so hard to be a man when you want to dress up and wear makeup because that's what makes me feel beautiful and what makes me feel like me and i have all these people you know rumors and shit telling me that like what makes me gay is that I dance feminine. What makes me gay is that I wear makeup. What makes me gay is that I, that I talk in a loud voice, in a high voice. That shit does not make me gay. That shit makes me human. And it makes me me. And the fact that I can go out and post on social media and show that, like, I love doing makeup. I love showing my body, fat body, because I love my body. And, you know, there's so many topics on where toxic masculinity is, you know, a topic that no one really talks about because it's not evident or, you know, it's not like prioritized. But, you know, when Riley mentioned people who are homosexual struggle with depression and anxiety a lot more than their heterosexual peers, it is true because I am a, I don't want to be a statistic, but I am because I have struggled so hard with that, you know, being and being 
a homosexual, it seems like I'm just put in this box and then males can just say, oh, you're that because that's who you are. And, you know, this phrase that always goes around is that's so gay. You know, I heard people say you're so fucking gay because you go ahead and you do skincare. I'm like, what the fuck does skincare have to do with me being gay? And, you know, it just hurts me because I'm just like, what do you identify as gay? Like, what does gay mean for you to say it so casually that you can go like, oh, that's so gay because you're wearing nail polish. The fuck? Sorry, I'm, so, I'm swearing a lot because I'm really mad. Um, but again, like, it's just like nail polish does not define me. And that does not, you cannot define me and write my story because I am me and I am who I am because I love who I am. And my authentic self cannot be torn because you believe that you have the audacity to say what you want to say because you have your privilege and I have mine and you feel like you have power over me. And so all in all, I just believe that toxic masculinity is a very, very, very big topic that we should touch upon. Um, and I'm glad that you guys are here today to talk about it because it is a very sensitive topic that not a lot of men talk about and that we need to identify. But thanks guys for listening. Jay, thank you so much for sharing your vulnerability there. I know that took a lot and uh, we definitely all appreciate it. And uh, we're here with you. Yeah, I want to say thanks for sharing that. Also, just want to chime in quickly. Skincare is awesome. So don't anyone say shit because you know what? I, you know, I love taking care of myself, you know, like it, there's nothing wrong with taking care of ourselves, you know, like I, I literally, I literally just the last couple of weeks and months been trying all these different facial cleansers and stuff just to see which works better. And like, you know what, who, who cares what anybody says to be honest, man. Jay, as much as possible, sending love through Zoom. Um, that was, that was big, you know, and, and that's, that's really what I think we're all talking about here is, is that vulnerability that Jay showed that's strength, right? That's, that's courage and, and leveraging some of those, those, um, male norms and scripts that we have, um, towards that. And, and I think what's really important out of this as well, too, is uh, personally in my work, I try not to use the word toxic masculinity because, you know, oftentimes in, in, you know, media and culture and all that stuff, it, it, it's often about how masculinity is wielded over, over women. And there's obviously gender-based violence and, and sexual harassment and all those awful things. But we practice this toxic masculinity uh, as men with each other as well, too, whether it be homophobia or even just like competition of dominance and violence that straight heteronormative men participate in as well too. So for me personally, all of this is patriarchy, right? And so like when we talk about patriarchy and, and a lot of those norms and stuff like that, and we can be, you know, I identify as a feminist, but like if we can be anti-patriarchal, you know, then we're on the same side. It's not men versus women and, and trying to get caught in those traps that some guys want to have these conversations with. It's like, no, this is a problem for all of us. And we overvalue some of these bro things, you know, like objectifying women, saying whatever we want, making homophobic jokes, all that stuff. But meanwhile, we're mega undervaluing like the depth of relationships, the health of relationships, the ability to practice self-care without shame, you know, uh, all these types of things that like, if we could just drop that, we would benefit so much and our society and culture would be so much better for. A lot of the toxic masculinity word, it is troubling. I just Googled up the definition and it says, thus defined by the traditional male gender roles that consequently stigmatize and limit the emotions boys and men may comfortably express while elevating other emotions such as anger. It's pretty vague, right? And I think all of us in this call are well-versed enough to know that the gender role uh, is no longer male and female. It's, it's very much a spectrum. And there's no reason that we should affix uh, skincare as something feminist. We, the skin is skin, right? Uh, women have skin and men have skin. Uh, so that shouldn't be a feminine, feminine trait per se. And similarly, I have buddies, moms who cut down the trees and their dads do the housework. There's nothing wrong with that, right? There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. And we shouldn't keep on acting as if that's not okay. People can do anything they're capable of. Growing up, I've been on lots of sports teams. And one thing that like was almost present on every sports team was kind of this idea that we're there to do sports. And even if we're buddy, we're never gonna talk about anything. So then growing up, there was this 
one person on another team that I was close with that actually committed suicide. And I remember going to practice, which was the day after that we learned the news. And rather than just sitting down with our coach or like just checking in upon each other, we're just there being like, look at each other and no one, no one's accepting that like, we need to talk about it. So everyone kind of just bottled it in and just went and kind of ignored the situation. But what happened was extremely serious. And that's something that like, I think is not addressed often is in the sports world, we gotta be okay, we gotta perform. I've had coaches that told me like, if you can still hit that time for running, you're fine, like you're showing up to practice. So it's kind of like this idea that like, if you, you gotta keep pushing, and even if something such traumatic can happen and people are willing to ignore it for what? For like a soccer game, for like a race? Like we've got to like check our priorities and decide like really like on the importance of where we put our value because as much as sports is important and can be a healthy coping mechanism, it should not be more important than talking about mental health. We've talked a lot about like the personal and cultural barriers, but there's systemic barriers as well too, right? Mm -hmm. Like, um, especially in terms of accessibility and affordability of health, uh, of like mental health care and supports. Oftentimes it's, it's for those like deep intervention, like for people who are struggling in silence and, you know, may not be in crisis and may not be able to afford the supports, there's a, a huge valley there where there's no supports. Um, so uh, I just wanted to quickly throw that in there as well too. Absolutely, Jake. And uh, that was touching on the point as well that traditionally the male root of seeking help often goes along the lines of full crisis that leads them into forced help to some extent. Uh, for example, I know a friend very dear to me who was going through schizophrenia and it took TLDR, it took a very large episode with police involved and forced care in a hospital for him to get any help. Whereas along the way, if there were just little exits on that highway where he could have reached out for help or we could have helped him find help, uh, this might have stopped massive crisis scenarios like a suicide attempt, for example, or like a complete mental breakdown and uh, a time off work or time from school. And that's traditionally how a lot of men end up finding help. So you're right in this, uh, this kind of socio way as well that we need to stop it from getting to such a crisis point and actually direct people to help before we get there. I think maybe somewhere deep in our brains, we think that face-to-face -face is a more intimate conversation to whatever extent. But I find, at least personally in my life, that I always have the best conversations shoulder to shoulder. Uh, some of the only times that I'll talk with friends is when we go on a drive. And we're not going on a drive. I didn't text my buddy to say, hey, let's talk about my girlfriend. We're going through something. But it just comes out when we're shoulder to shoulder, somehow both staring off at the road, we're actually able to divulge these deep secrets within us. During drives, it works a lot. Like I realized that with my friends, you know, like for us to like just have our mind, like our, our mind is focusing on what we're saying, but also just like staring out, just like looking at the cars or just looking at what's passing by. Like it's like a calming mechanism, I guess, for guys. Um, and another thing is like whenever guys have intimate conversations like face to face, it just seems like, you know, they're like, oh, no homo. And it's just like, bro, like I just want to be able to like have a good conversation with you. It's like, I don't like you, bro. But like, again, like we have to normalize that and normalize the fact of conversations can be like so cherished uh, and the fact that Brittany Brown says like vulnerability is power and we need to see that because like when we when we start being vulnerable and we start being more open and especially knowing our mental health literacy for example not saying that someone committed suicide I know you said that Patrice so I just want to uh, kindly correct you on that um it's just something I learned because committing a crime is different than committing suicide because when we say committing suicide it just seems like they they did something really, really wrong. And of course it is wrong, um, but to, to humanize it and to see it as, you know, like we want to grow from it. I always just say like, oh, they died from suicide or they passed away from suicide. And that, it's a little bit more common to say, because again, it just doesn't sound like a, a slap, like, oh, they committed suicide. It just like hits different. Um, but I think again, like having these kind of like, normalizing talk where it's like, oh, they passed by by suicide um, and they struggle with depression. Like being more normalizing about our conversations um, being more mindful of it can definitely make an influence on a guy's 
point of view of how mental health is because when we start talking about stuff normalizing it talking about it like football we can definitely change lives because again they're gonna be like oh like yeah it's chill like it's fine to talk about it it's not just gonna be like oh this entire taboo topic um but definitely i think we should be able to have good mental health literacy for us to be able to break down these barriers yeah well thank you jay for correcting me because personally like i wouldn't even know it because like it's kind of like how i grew up and that's where i wanted to talk about like kind of the education system it's kind of like i know for me personally where i went to school maybe we had five presentations regarding mental health we never really talked about it we never even like knew how to say proper things so the only way that like i personally learned was just by opening up and talking to people who experienced it and i think that's something we really got to change like in how like we educate younger generations to start the conversation younger because if they're going to start younger it's going to be normal for them when they're 20 30 80 to talk about it but if we never like actually start young they get out of it they're 18 20 and they're going to be like oh that's I, we didn't grow up like this this is not normal we're not doing it it's kind of like breaking down and accepting it and implementing it in the school system yeah and also jay i love that point on mental health literacy i think that's a really good topic i think that's incredibly important for what we're about to get into now which is more ways we can help men and reach out uh but with that uh be careful about the way you're describing things right so for example don't say your buddy's depressed you can say that he's sad or that he's going through something depressed or depression are actually a medical term Right. So just because your buddy is sick, you don't necessarily say the illness he has. You say he's sick. Right. He's not feeling great. Uh, things like that, as well as even uh, using the word insane or crazy to explain someone going through mental health illness. Uh, that is that is old diction. We, we don't use those words anymore. Right. So being careful and being ginger in the way you address some of these terms in these conversations we're about to talk about is really, really important. One thing signs that something might be uh, not where maybe it should be in terms of like mental health is, I don't know if this resonate, resonates for anybody else, but for me, like when my mental health was like the worst, it was like, okay, like let's go be promiscuous now. Like that was like the thing for me, right? So I mean, when it, you know, you talk about the alcohol and the drugs, it's like, for me, you know, it was like those things were just like a part of, you know, let's go and, you know, chase women now. Um, and, you know, for me, it was kind of like, I felt bad inside i didn't know what to deal with it i didn't know why or what was happening but i know that this other thing made me feel good um in a way that other things just didn't so you know that became like the goal for me um you know was you know to i don't know what it was but it was, it was like if i could you know have sex or have some kind of sexual encounter or whatever it was like oh that made me feel better but then you know you end up using people obviously um and that's challenging for a variety of reasons but um you know for me it was like and you know sometimes what's interesting is like your boys will be like yo this guy is hooking up with all these girls like yo that's the man right there you know what i mean uh but like actually what it really meant was like i wasn't the man because i just i wasn't good you know um and for me it's like if you're gonna say you're the man that means you're you're being respectful and responsible and those pieces that's what that means for me and not because you know i went out here and you you saw me with you know a bunch of women or what have like that i don't necessarily think that's uh something we should put on a pedestal um and when we do it's like then we don't ignore what or then we start to ignore what that might mean uh for somebody and why that person is doing that it's a dopamine hit right like going out and being promiscuous and, and getting that dopamine. And, and for me, you know, I was lucky when I was struggling with my depression when I was 22, that my coping mechanism was, this was primarily during a summer and off season. I worked a manual labor job for like, you know, 14 hours a day. And then I'd come home, I'd eat, and then I'd go to the gym for two and a half hours, right? And, and that's a form of self-harm. And it's like you said, you know, like when you're being promiscuous, people are like, yo, that's the man. And like that summer I came back and I was so fit and everyone and, and nobody knew the pain beneath that. Right. Because I, I didn't want to feel I was hurting my body in that sense. And, and, you know, when you work out and you're on that stuff, that's that dopamine hit too. 
However, you know what else gives you a dopamine hit? A nice long hug, five seconds, hug your boys, right? Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. And uh, when it comes down to it, these are all just uh, things that carefully actuate the buttons in our head that are our neuroreceptors, right? And uh, drugs and sex actually hit the same buttons, right? So as you're saying, Asante, uh, you might go out and, or one might go out and be promiscuous. But again, that's just a short term pleasure that is in ways, you know, no different than taking a hit of whatever drug of your choosing, right? So these are a lot of ways that men kind of hide from emotions and hide from the realities that are oftentimes quite tough to face and talk about. Yeah, just exactly. Just touching on those same points. Like for me, it was video games and to a certain extent drugs, but it was, it's just that distraction. It's like, it doesn't feel better all the time, but in that moment when you are doing that thing to distract yourself, you're not focused on the thing that's causing you pain. So in a way, it's helping you in that moment, but again, the short term, it's not actually getting to the root of the problem. And even like, I, you know, it comes up all the time, like, or not all the time, but it happens where if I'm going through a really tough time, um, like have a stressful week at work and school, it'd be like, oh, like it'd be great if I could just play video games. But for me, I have to be really intentful about it. Like, am I playing this? Am I going to be playing this video game because I want to distract myself from whatever stress that I'm feeling? Or am I using it as a release? I'm using it to actually benefit, use it as a time off to release energy. So I think there's, you can do certain things and they can be productive, but it can be harmful. I think it really depends on your intention. I think a personal experience for me, and I, and I touched on this earlier, was um, sort of getting introduced to nature. And that all began when I was working for a not-for-profit. During that time, my boss just noticed that I was a bit off. And so he, he was the one who you know, introduced me to this place called Windhorse Farm, 300 acre lot and there's cabins in the woods and there's old growth forests and you know, just go. And me as someone who never really spent much time in, uh, in nature growing up, it was, it was very foreign to me to be in a cabin with no electricity. Um, <laughs> but uh, it was an experience that I really enjoyed. And, you know, together with him, we went for a walk and just having space um, to just like breathe and, and slow down and to be around, you know, nature and other beings was, was really useful for me. And so nowadays, whenever, you know, I have a friend who's dealing with an issue, I, I tend to maybe invite them to go for a walk in the forest somewhere. We go somewhere where there's, there are trees and other, other forms of life. So. Yeah, that's amazing. It's a really good point. I think it's something that a lot of people maybe don't even realize that they're doing is seeking out nature. I think everyone can relate, you know, it's fall, for example, right now, looking out the window and seeing these beautiful orange and red colors, like you're, you're bound to feel something, right? And it is kind mm -hmm. of calming knowing that, hey, the world goes on, the seasons change, you know, things like that. And, you know, my life, even though it might be confined to this computer screen, and I'm so stressed out, you know, you look outside and seasons are still changing, you know, the squirrels are still doing their thing, you know, and it, it is kind of a nice way to pull away from some of that technology that we're constantly, constantly surrounded with. I, I think nature truly is an amazing escape and uh, a way to just be still and to be with your own thoughts uh, for a little bit. For me, for example, uh, it's usually running and I've found that I have my best runs when I'm in a trail, you know, completely lost in a forest or something like that. Uh, even today, I just came back from rock climbing and uh, we went outside in Niagara, Niagara Glen is the area. And you know, it's just, it's just people hanging out in nature and being still and being one with themselves. Uh, so I think that's a really amazing thing. For me, I'm gonna steal what Jake said, man. Like, you gotta give the brothers a hug sometime, you know? So, uh, I, you know, that's something that me and my friends start to embrace as we, you know, cross that threshold into being over 30. Uh, <laughs> I think we just start to like, let go of some of these things a little bit more. Uh, but to just normalize that kind of stuff and say, yo, like, I love you, bro. Like, that kind of stuff, you know, it really goes a long way because uh, when my boys hit me with that, it makes me feel like these aren't just my friends anymore. They're my brothers, you know. So uh, for me, that's that's something. Yeah, uh, definitely. That's something, Asante, that my friends and I growing up through high school and everything, we've really grown in that way. We're able to be a lot more intimate with each other and say, yeah, you know, like, I really respect you. I do love you. And you know, I appreciate you. 
I have I have a, a recurring reminder in my phone um, to check in on a friend every weekend when I get a little bit more time. Um, I lived a lot of places in the world, so I have a lot of friends in, in different places. And um, on weekends is when I can find time to kind of reach out and stuff like that. And it's so easy to get lost in, in kind of your own life and, and what you're going through. And, and in that reminder, you know, I, I write a little note with their name and what they're going through. So like, you know, I have a friend with a new kid. I have a friend who hates his job. I have a friend who, you know, is dealing, is in quarantine because they're, you know, uh, physically distancing right now, right? So it, it's just that reminder every week to, to kind of reach out. And, you know, just like we said earlier, um, the worst thing that happens is they're like, no, nah, I'm good. But like, they know because you're asking that you are a safe space and that if they ever had anything, that you'd be the first person they turn to. So, so that's something that I do. Uh, I know that for myself, mostly what I do, because a lot of my friends are all athletes. And what we like to do is be active. But like one thing we always do is like, we'll have this like long stretching session. So like, we're not putting like as much pressure as like running laps or like, we're just like really stretching, taking our time. And like, we can have like real convos. And just from there, we're all like, more energized and just helps us like power through a day and then end around with some bro hugs and we're all good to go just a, a quick uh plug if you'll forgive me and it doesn't have to be these ones but um next gen men made these cards for masculinity um and it's just a deck of cards and within the deck you can pull a card and there's a question like have you ever lost a friend who was important to you how did that feel and like having a resource like that and like lots of people make these types of things, it externalizes the question, right? It doesn't make it like personal, like I ask you this or you have to volunteer this. It's like, nah, the card, the card asked that, you know? So um, there's always ways to, to externalize those things too. Um, yeah, Jake, there's this, this game called We're Not Really Strangers. Have you ever heard of it before? Yeah, like that is, it's a really, really good game that I use with my friends. That's so good that you do that because again, like, the we're not really changing this game is expensive um and again i hope it's not expensive when you're selling or giving out uh, because again like it just it just initiates the prompts that you want to be able to initiate without having like this awkward like uh so like how have you been doing <laughs> like have that weird transition yeah certainly I, I think a huge one you know kind of on that feel note uh in an age of physical distance anyway we're turning our sights a lot more inwards to social media and that's kind of becoming more than ever uh, your outward portrayal. Um, so for example, this could look in any type of change, right? So it could be posting more, or maybe someone who posts all the time is posting less. Uh, maybe some of the captions are changing from a happier tone to a more self-inflected tone or anything like that. But really any degree of change is reason to reach out to a friend. And as you said, you know, you just kind of reach out and you might say, hey, but Another great way you can reach out is just by stating something that you're noticing, uh, because that's undeniable. It's the truth. Hey, I noticed you're not posting as much anymore. What's you? You okay? Right? Uh, you're, you're not prying at all, but you are just stating that you notice. You're implying that you care, and already right there, that might be enough to let them know that they're loved, even if they don't want to answer you. I think that's an amazing way to reach out, and that's something I do myself. Um, also, another thing I've been doing recently is Snapchat's coming up with memories all the time. And at least where I connected with most of my friends was a couple of years ago in university. Um, I'll send these kind of pre-quarantine memories to my friends. And if it's nothing else, it's a happy memory, a, a nice brief moment away from your life, wherever it is. But sometimes it leads into a conversation, you know, talking about a nicer place, a nicer time, whatever happened to blank, things like that. And before you know it, you're actually talking. My girlfriend and I have this thing called like well-being Wednesday check-ins and so every Wednesday night we do a well-being check-in and so it's sort of a, an intentional time where we can check in with each other and I think it also helps like I think guys can use this when wanting to check in check in with friends who you know you may sus suspect something's going on. Yeah I think that's a really great idea especially when someone maybe hasn't shared uh, or is apprehensive to share Mm -hmm. uh, giving them that kind of time, you know, to prepare for their presentation, as it were, and really package up the details they want to disclose, the things they might want to keep within them, uh, might make them feel more comfortable kind of coming forward to you with this, you know, properly packaged version of what they're ready to share. I think yeah. that's a really good idea. You know, I'm a big believer uh, in, in love, um, and not just of the romantic variety. Uh, you know, I, I think, I 
think the answer to you know that question, Riley, is a lot simpler than we make it out to be. Uh, I think if we were a society that focused more on uh, on, on love and and empathy and and care and compassion and kindness, that it would be absolutely transformative. I, I think for a little while we've started to trend in the direction as a society of criticism and one of shaming people and one of uh, judgment and a lack of acceptance. And, and I, I see that happen in, in so many places. I mean, you know, social media is a big one. You know, you're on Instagram or you're on Twitter or what have you. It's like, you know, people just, you know, see a thing and comment and, don't think about the fact that there's someone else on the other end of the screen uh, or that you probably don't have the full context of whatever someone else has posted. Um, and, you know, we just, we started just tearing people down instead of building people up. I think Asante nailed it. Love, right? Like if we look at all the major issues that we're going through the world, whether it be toxic masculinity, Black Lives Matter, truth and reconciliation, um, celebrating pride, it's all love, right? And and finding that common humanity, as, as Jay said. And so I think that that's really important is leading with that love and, and, and um, seeing the value in others um, as equal to our own. And um, then beyond that as well, too, I think, uh, you know, thinking of men specifically and, and kind of the work that we're trying to do, like look at the diversity that we had in this conversation of, of lived experiences and how much we learn from one another. And then, you know, the fact that, that we're together doing this, um, there's something within masculinity that still says we need to be individual, we need to be on our own, we need to lead um, and, um, you know, how do we come together? How do we, we pull together? Because if we're pulling individually in different directions, we're, we're killing each other's momentum. So uh, much love and respect for this conversation. Yeah, so kind of just like, we got to keep like a domino effect. So like, let's spread love. Like, we know it can help. So like, even if someone's telling us like, it's dumb, it's this, it's something like, who cares? Because we're only going to bring change one person at a time so let's start by just sharing love like if it's hugging your neighbor just like maybe not in a pandemic but v hugs are a thing so like let's just like spread love and like don't be scared of like what other people are saying because the society is shifting towards that so hop on the train make a change for yourself and others will follow yeah, I mean, I don't think I can say it any better than you guys have summed up. It's exactly that. I think um, we really are in a climate where everything feels so polarized, right? There is so much this side versus this side. You see it in politics, but everything starts at home. It starts with yourself and the people around you. And that can be something as simple as, hey, I believe this. You believe this. This is why we're different. This is why we can't get along, right? But it's that fundamental belief that because someone else is looks different thinks different whatever it is that they aren't that you're not compatible but like it's like it's that love that you say i i respect your opinion i respect who you are i respect what you have to say and i think it's that open-mindedness that changes the whole platform and opens everything up to more compassion understanding uh, yeah, I, I think you guys did an amazing job of summing that all up and that it's more just the effort of love and uh, being there for uh, guys here and there and wherever across the world, despite differences. Uh, there's a really, really resonating uh, kind of quote that someone said in this, I forgot, forgive me, but uh, they said, why do we have to wait until November to talk about men? I thought that was a very, very strong point. And I think leaving this conversation, that's one thing I'll definitely bring with me because Granted, this will be released in November, and November is the time that we talk about mental health. Uh, originally, November was for prostate and testicular cancer, and now it's transformed into this beautiful area of men's mental health and men's well-being, and seeing how a healthy man can actually change a community. It can lower rates of crime. It can do so many beautiful things to different relationships. So I think really leaving this conversation, I want to inspire people to do things for men uh, just beyond Mo November and November sp specifically. And uh, to kind of lead with love, as Asante said, I think that's a really powerful quote. Uh, so 
wrapping this all up, I just really wanted to thank you guys so much uh, for coming here. Uh, if anyone has something kind of lasting for the audience here that they want to leave us with, that would be great. And otherwise, thank you very much, guys, and stay safe. I just want to say thank you very much uh, to, you know, everybody here for sharing this space together um, and for, you know, bringing forth your stories and all of that piece. I really appreciate it. Very humbling for me. So thank you. But yeah, again, thank you guys again for being just so open and loving and caring. Um, we are truly making a stand. Like I can see that through everyone here because, you know, we're taking our time to just work through this and we're taking the time to be able to talk about these issues. And it is amazing to see that because we don't really see that every day. So this is basically, you know, like that foundation that we're building upon. So thank you guys so much. And I really appreciate everyone's support here. Yeah, definitely. Like so much appreciation for everyone here. Uh, going to this panel, I wanted to learn as much as I can and grow as much as I can and hopefully provide, you know, some insight through discussion with, with everyone here to the audience. And I think collectively we've all done such an amazing job. And I feel like I've learned so much from everyone you're sharing their experiences. So thank you. Yeah, just to build on that, thank you everyone for sharing. And I love y'all. Love you too. It's an honor <laughs> to be human with all of you. And uh, thanks to Jack.org for bringing us together. I wrote something the other day on social media and it got a really positive response. I've never written something like that before. I'll share what I wrote is a small tweet. Uh, so I wrote, in 2002, a child who immigrated to Canada was bullied for his Indian accent in grade three slash four. Today, that man just gave a presentation to a grade three slash four class at the same elementary school on mental health, climate change, and bullying. That kid was me, and that man is me. So that was something that I shared on social media just a few days ago, and I got thousands of responses back just showcasing the power that that small message had. Um, I was bullied heavily. I already talked about that, but it's how I overcame that I think is my message to all the youth out there is that bullying and other things in your life are going to impact your mental health. It's so important for you to reach out um, to someone that you trust. It doesn't have to be your parents. It doesn't have to be your siblings. It can be your teacher. It can be your principal. And for the men out there, don't feel like you can't cry in your life. I used to sometimes feel that. And sometimes I felt like I can't cry. Like I physically can't cry anymore. I don't know why. But after I started seeing men around me started to cry and open up, I realized, okay, there was a wall and a barrier that just lifted off me. And I felt like, okay, I think it's normal to cry in situations where you are feeling emotional and letting it out. So don't listen to anyone who tells you uh, you can't cry and that you have to um, be a certain type of man. You be yourself and the rest will follow. Uh, just reach out for help when you can. Great, that's amazing. And uh, that, that was a very, very well done uh, little piece you prepared there and I, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, what I kind of want to leave off with here is tying a bit into what I was hoping for in the future and maybe that of a call to action. Uh, ties in great, Suk, with what you just said. Uh, you presented this message to your platform. You were open, you were vulnerable. And I think that's very powerful. What I would encourage you guys to do as listeners here is to use your own platform. Uh, your platform could be anything. It could be via whatever means you have to spread it uh, within your school, your world, your family, your various social media accounts. It doesn't matter how big or how small. What matters is that your platform is your own that the difference is going to start with you listening to this as you're already listening to this uh, you want to make a difference so I, I do implore you to use your platform for good and dare to be a little bit vulnerable and really challenge the norms so with that guys thank you so much for coming out to today's call really appreciate you making the time for this prior to coming into this call we were eight complete strangers and uh, I don't think I've ever gotten so vulnerable with such a group of people so quickly in such a short amount of time so Maybe that's a good lesson as well, is be open to being vulnerable. So thank you guys so much, and thank you, Jack.org, for this.